stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, it's a great honor to welcome Bill Liao, general partner with SOS Ventures and co-founder of Coder Dojo. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you very much for having me, Ed. It's great to have you on the show, man. There's so much to talk to you about because you've done so many things. You're one of those real mavericks. Before we talk about all that stuff you've done, it'd be great to talk about how you got here. How did you get to Ireland and how did the journey begin? Sure. So, you know, the entrepreneurial journey began when my wife went to a meeting of an organization called The Hunger Project back in Melbourne years and years ago. And, you know, she came back from that meeting saying that there was a new way to end hunger and that she just pledged a lot of money to them and that I had to go and see them. And I kind of rolled up my sleeves and like, yeah, I'm going to come and see them. All right. You pledged how much? <laughs> and, uh, and I went and saw them and was immediately impressed. Um, and the leader there, Lolita, you know, uh, I went up to her and said, listen, you know, we're broke. We have, we, we've got more debt than cash. Uh, more, I can't fulfill on that pledge that my wife made, um, neither can she. And uh, the leader said, listen, you, you know, what if you could, but without any suffering on your part, what would that look like? And I got this vision of handing over one of those big checks, you know, one of, in, a, in a tux and everything with a big smile. I thought, that would look pretty good. And so I used that as motivation and I went out and actually quit my job and learned how to sell. And I was a, a computer hardware tech at the time and uh you know after learning how to sell i did a, a went out and actually started my own first business and sold that and invested in another and then kept on going so i've done a couple of unicorns of you know had had a uh, couple of companies that have, have had over a billion dollar market cap and we moved to switzerland for a while and then my wife again intervened and said listen i want to i want you know the kids to finish growing up in an english-speaking country and we picked ireland and we've been living in the west of Cork ever since. And that was your, nine years ago. Is your wife, is she, she's Australian as well, Bill, is she? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we moved the whole family to Switzerland and then to Ireland. I thought perhaps she might have had Irish blood and that's what brought her here, but it wasn't that at all. In the distant, distant past, my family comes from the Isle of Turin near Scotland. Um, half of my family, the other half comes from China. Uh, and she has got, again, distant relatives from County Antrim. So, Bill, that got you to Ireland. So, that's nine years ago? And then... Coder yep. Dojo came along because that's around that time. Yep. Um, actually, uh, you know, I was asked by this young fellow, James Welton, to come in and, and make an investment in his technology startup. And he, he just finished his leaving cert. And, you know, as, a, as an investor, my question is always, how many people in your tech team? And I'm usually highly disappointed by the answer because people will say, oh, they've got a, a great CEO and a great marketing officer and a great this and a great that, but they're going to outsource the development to India. And it's a bit like somebody coming up to you and saying, you know, I'm going to open a fantastic restaurant on the high street. You know, we have a magnificent sommelier, you know, our, our waitresses and waiters are all going to be supermodels. The front of house, uh, you know, used to work at Buckingham Palace. And then you go, well, you know, who's the chef? And they go, oh, we're outsourcing the food to McDonald's, who we have a very special relationship with and give us really good prices. Yeah, you really got to own your tech these days, don't you, man? To be able uh, to be agile and just change stuff, you got to be, you got, that's got to be the center of your marketing is your tech almost these days. It is. It is. I mean, look at a Kickstarter, right? And, you know, our hacks program pumps out million dollar Kickstarters, and I can tell you they've all got in house tech. But anyway, so James comes to me for money and I ask him the question. He said, I've got three developers, including myself. And I'm like, how does an 18 year old get three developers? And he goes, Oh, I taught them. And it turned out he'd started a computer club at his school at Prez. And, uh, you know, because he'd won a web award and all these kids found out and in, out of the generosity of his spirit, he said, oh, well, I'll start a, a computer club and teach them. And I said, wow, I was really impressed. And I said, wow, you must be so proud. And he said, no, I'm actually really unhappy. And I went, why? And he said, well, because I've done my leaving cert, the, um, you know, the school is shutting the club down because they've got no one to run it if, after I'm gone. And that's when these two phenomena clicked for me because – on one side, I'm seeing all these companies without techs. On the other side, here is one of the better schools in Ireland 
unable to run a, comu- a simple computer club because they didn't have technical staff. Time after time, I go up to people who have been successful programmers, you know, started businesses, and I ask them, so when did you start programming? And I get an answer like, oh, you know, eight, nine years old. I go, wow, that's great. Do you have kids? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I've got a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old boy and a girl. I'm like, that's wonderful. And I'm like, do they code? Uh, uh. Yeah. And so I asked James, look, would you, if I could get you a venue for free, would you come and run the club with me for anyone to come along? And, you know, I'll help with the branding and everything. We'll come up with a name for it and stuff. And he's like, no, nah, you're crazy. Nobody's going to give you a full free venue. And uh, yeah. guess what? National Software Center gave us a free venue the next week. And that's where Coda Dojo was born in Cork. How long did it take to fill it? Because I know you got to capacity pretty quickly. I'd say the first dojo was full after a month or two. And, and you know, we came up with the name. I mean, it wouldn't have worked with the original name, Saturday Morning Programming Club for Kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't sound as cool, man. Koda means programmer, dojo means temple of learning. So, you know, we, we really went for the martial arts theme. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's working well. We're in 69 countries and uh, some very big things are happening in order to, to make the international expansion bigger. And uh, we have about 30 dojos just in Cork. Um, we've been overtaken, though. I, uh, I, I've sort of in mixed feelings about this. The the uh, city now with the most dojos in it is Perth in West Australia. They've got 80 dojos. As an Aussie, I'm like, wow, go Aussie. As a Corkonian, I'm like, hey, we've got to catch up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> One thing I've noticed with people like yourself, people who are starters and, and just get things done, is that, and, and particularly when you're successful, is that the, this genero- spirit of generosity and of, of paying it forward is kind of inbuilt into that. And it's very much, because you mentioned the Japanese culture, cultural part of Kodo Dojos, but that, that spirit of kind of uh, a his, holistic approach is certainly uh, amidst the Kodo Dojo mantra. Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, not only is it child-led learning at Kodo Dojo, it's experiential learning. And, you know, one of the things that you can do is, is you know, get a, get a belt or a badge for being a mentor. So, you know, the expectation is the kids actually, to sustain the dojo, they start passing on what they've learned. And that's a really powerful thing for them as well because when you pass on what you learn, you actually learn it better. Yeah, yeah for sure, when you have to teach what you learn. And do, you know, do you know one of the things I always struck, always struck me, Bill, was in a world where, you know, the education system isn't ideal for somebody who may have dyslexia or dyspraxia or, or countless other autism that that coder dojo almost becomes a way to be self-validated and and so where they don't get that recognition or they don't get that kind of fulfillment in a school coder dojo gives them that absolutely i mean and it's and it's not just self-validation it's also validation of your peers based on on the merit of what you do the idea that we can be reduced to a series of numbers in a test is I think, frankly, ridiculous. But that's what that's what passes for education a lot in a lot of places in the world. Toto Dojo, you know, the expectation is you get good, and yeah, you know, it may take years to get good. I mean, the other thing I can tell you that anybody who's been who's successful in getting things done, you know, not only are they paying it forward, but but they've learned how to fail and pick themselves up. You just don't get that opportunity in a lot of places to fail and pick yourself up and be also lifted up by your 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 buddies. And Coda Dojo really celebrates that. I mean, coding is in large part about both a little bit of plagiarism in open source and a lot of failure. Um, and, and that's not, not really suited for a lot of academic contexts. <laughs> yeah, because one of the things I, I love about the concept is school, the way the education system is set up, and even in third level education, it's about collecting dots. And mm. Coder Dojos of the world and and those type of approaches are about connecting dots. And, and it's, yep. a, it's a much better way of working. And I'm sure it's inbuilt in you as an entrepreneur as well. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to steal that, by the way. <laughs> For sure, man. Yeah, no, but it's <laughs> so true. It is very true. It's very true. Yeah. And I, I got a segue for you here because the, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people don't realize that so many of the careers that they think are important now are just going to evaporate. 
I mean, last year there was a study done where they, you know, IBM Watson, you know, they taught this supercomputer how to play chess. It beat the chess champion. They taught, taught it how to play Jeopardy. It beat the Jeopardy champion. They taught it how to play Go. It beat the jo- Go champion. Well, last year they taught it how to diagnose cancer. Yeah. And they gave a, a panel of top oncologists um, symptom data from a bunch of patients that had been tracked, and they gave Watson the same data. And Watson analyzed the data in minutes, and the and, and the oncologists, uh, you know, analyzed the data over a period of hours. The oncologists uh, got it fifty percent right, and Watson got it ninety ninety six percent right. So, and that, and you know, and these were real cancer diagnoses, real symptoms, real patients that were tracked through, you know, to prove this. Now. You know that kind of uh, application of AI is going to be everywhere. Yeah. So what what's going to be left to us? Well, you know, law. That's not going to be a great career for you for your child. Um, you know, a lot large parts of medical diagnostics not going to be a great career for your child. Uh, accountancy that can all be done by computer. Yeah. Creating stuff with code much harder for a computer to do. Yeah. Like scut work, fine. Yeah. You know that's going to disappear. But actually, the acts of creation. And in areas that you you know people haven't traditionally associated with computers, so uh, a lot of people don't realise that DNA is digital, um, and that it's it, it can be coded. And in fact, there are high level computer languages like Antha um, that you can actually write code in a high level, and it will actually encode in DNA that's actually functional. Yeah, man, I've been I've been really delving into that world of J. Craig Venter. It's phenomenal yep. stuff that's going on, and and it's something that you're very close to at the moment oh absolutely so i am actually giving this interview you you might hear some background noise this is actually at a lab in ucc that we rent for the summer and in this lab with me are 15 startups all doing new things with biology and uh, we call it rebel bio and it's part of the sosv portfolio and you know in in this very lab we have had over the last four, four cohorts and in this cohort, just some amazing things happen. So from one of the first cohorts, we had a team called MooFree, and they're now called Perfect Day. Uh, they reprogrammed the DNA of yeast so that instead of brewing alcohol, you brew milk, cow milk brewed wow. out of yeast with no cow suffering during that process. Um, we have a team here called Alternative Plants that you know there are some phytofunctional ingredients. These are these are amazing new compounds that have been discovered in plants that are actually endangered. Uh, so you can't harvest them. So you can't put them in your cosmetics or your skincare because they're endangered species. Um, alternative plants they take a, a a couple of stem cells from the plant and they've worked out a way of actually having those cells multiply on mass in a bioreactor. And so you can get as much of these new antioxidants and other amazing compounds from these endangered species without ever harming nature or harming the plant. Um, we've got, uh, you know, a team here called Sex Positive that have created a diagnostic test for chlamydia that's like a pregnancy test. Uh, I mean, we've got all these smart technologies around us, but why don't we have smart diagnostics with us in our homes? Well, these guys are solving that. Brilliant, man. You know? because- it, it's a real. I mean, you mentioned the segue about AI and and automation taking over a lot of jobs, and because th- there's this kind of several forces happening at once, and one of them is mass urbanization. The other one is job losses through automation, automation or AI, and then yep. the other one is the, the the defeating of age. So people are living longer, health is getting better, more people are dying from obesity than they are from starvation, and so therefore, there's going to be loads more people in the world, and where's the food going to come from? Because with fossil fuels and, and you know cow um, excretion, etc., we can't just get loads more cows. <laughs> so th- <laughs> this stuff is bang on what we need for the future. Uh, it, you know, the engines of life are you know discovering how to program life is as important as the discovery of fire. You know, it, it is that level. And the ability to combine programming with life, you know, not only is it a great source of, of all the things we need, but it's also you know, an amazing source of startups, an amazing source of jobs, an amazing source of new ways of looking at the world. Um, and all of this is 
because of this collision of digital and biotech. And you know, I'm happy to say that the first biotech accelerator program on planet Earth happened right here in Cork. Just, yeah. you know, not even two kilometers away from where Coda Dojo started. It's fantastic, man. And it's a credit to you and the team and, and I know Namesh is involved as well. And it's just it's such an exciting thing to be part of. Well, I mean Namesh yeah, they, they went through our Rebel Bio program, um, you know, and they've actually, a team from India have set up in Cork and they've set up the first DNA foundry in the whole of Ireland, the first commercial DNA foundry right here in Cork. And they were able to do it in, you know, three months and a hundred grand. You know, if you try to set up a DNA foundry three years ago, you know, ask Craig Venter, you would have, you would have, you would have taken, you know, three years to do it. And you would have spent, you know, hundreds of millions. And what what is that, um, Bill? I don't know what that is, a DNA, DNA foundry. DNA foundry actually allows you to make new DNA, to actually make a strip of DNA that does something new. In fact, Namesh and his team are doing it so cheaply that you can actually use it for data storage. Wow. And, you know, DNA is actually one of the most stable data storage devices ever. I mean, think about it. It has to be stable because... We, you know, we as organisms have been using it for hundreds of millions of years to 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 store our pattern, <laughs> our design. You can actually store computer data in DNA, and it will last for thousands and thousands of years. It's kind of cool. It, it kind it? of beats my my lacy disk uh, hard disk. <laughs> I can get rid of that now. I'm going to store my store well, my data in, inside me. In each of your cells, and you've got trillions of cells. There's six gigabytes of DNA storage. Right, that stores the image of you. Yeah. Um, that's about the same as a decent-sized memory stick. It's also the same as the entire contents of Wikipedia right now. So, you know, in each one of your cells, you've got essentially the, uh, you know, a copy of Wikipedia, and you've got trillions of them. So there's an enormous capacity to store information. Nature has figured this out a long time ago. Yeah. And do you know what, do you know what it kind of is triggered in my mind is the guys are finding new ways of creating food for a world that needs more food and the disruption that will bring to more synthetic foods in the world or you know lesser uh, quality foods that are being mass produced so there's a whole disruption going to happen there as well and then oh, absolutely. E- even this with storage it's going to totally disrupt a whole industry oh every industry is just ripe for disruption anything that you can make on a large scale if you can program bacteria to do it like little nanorobots you can make it on a nanoscale as well yeah and you can make big stuff using nanomaterials yeah um and and you can make stuff you can eat that's safe to eat it's delicious to eat that's exactly the same as you would get it in nature like uh, not not just like nature but exactly identical well, they're called biosimilars they're the same thing and you can probably input more of what you what you would desire and it, it's like Pity there's so much fat in an avocado or whatever. You know, you might be able to input more of what you want. Well, well, actually, you know, fat is probably the least dangerous thing to eat, uh, except for trans fats. What's dangerous is sugar. Um, and so last year we had a team that actually makes protein that tastes sweet and it crystallizes like sugar. So, you know, you can use it like sugar. It's heat stable like sugar. And yet it's a protein instead of a, su- instead of a sugar. So how, how long has Rebel Bio been in, in action? Uh, so we've been going for four years now. We, we started off calling ourselves Symbio Accelerator and then Indie Bio. And now we've, we've settled on Rebel Bio because like this is the Rebel County after all. Oh yeah, nice man, nice. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a cool name. It's like your Kodo Dojo choice. So Bill, <laughs> there's an event coming up on the 2nd of June. Yep, we have our, our demo day and uh, you know, the, all the teams are going to be out, out there pitching and um, if people want details, they can just go to rebelbio, R-E-B-E-L-B-I-O dot co and uh, they can see all the teams that are there and there will also be event details posted soon. And, and I'm sure some people are kind of going, I want to be part of that. So that's the event to come along to to begin that journey. Yep, absolutely. Bill, it's, it's uh, an absolute pleasure talking to you and... Uh, Congratulations on your all your achievements in the past and the many to come, I'm sure. Bill Leo, general partner with SOS Ventures and co-founder of Coder Dojo. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. So now on the Innovation Show, welcome Niels Raymond, CEO and founder of Canwavo. Welcome to the show, Niels. 
Thanks. Pleasure to be here. It's not the type of typical product we usually have a platform or a new innovation. It is an innovation of sorts, which is a, a huge growing burgeoning trend that a lot of people don't understand, which is the world, world of cannabinoids, etc. Niels, over to you, man. Well, Canoevo is, uh, came out of the idea or out of, of seeing a problem in the medical cannabis world because most of the, the cannabis, when we talk about medical cannabis, is just the flower of the, of the plant to the extent of maybe an extract and an oil. The problem that we see in Canada where we have a medical cannabis program now for four years that 99% of doctors are still uncomfortable prescribing it, although they're allowed to do it, but they don't like to prescribe a flower or, a, or an oil from a straight plant extract because it's just not standardized. They don't know really how it works. Uh, it's just too many different chemicals in it. Uh, we know like most of the time we're looking at aspirin or anything else that we take. It's, it's one compound that they like to prescribe and that's always the same dose and they know how it works and they know what it does. And that just isn't given in, in cannabis at the present time. Let's talk about like you, because I, I think to, to give a bit of context, you left mm. Ar- Ireland, you came to Ireland, you're German, you have an Irish wife, you went to Canada and yes. you, you, you sampled this over there. Um, you saw this growth of this industry, I suppose. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that to give a bit of context to where you came up with the idea. Yeah, I, I did my PhD through UCD in pharmacology and uh, finished in 2008 and went to Canada to first start working as a method development chemist for a, a governmental FIFA service lab, really. And uh, I was there for five years. And right at the end, I was leading the um, analysis for medical cannabis as it was just coming up in the new legislation and regulation. That time was called the MMPR, the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulation. That's when I saw that this is a, it's going to be a really, really big industry. Then I started my own business as a consultant for quality assurance and standardization for the MMPR applicants so that they can go and apply and get licensed through Health Canada and the government. Four years later, now I'm here as a CEO and founder of, of Canoevo and going into the drug development, which is always something that has, of course, as a pharmacologist, interested me the most. Yeah, because I, I was looking recently at uh, you know, trades of, of cannabinoid and medic- medicinal cannabis. It's, it's massive in the States. It is a, a massive exponential growth. I, I hear every time I, I hear new numbers uh, in terms of, of money generated in the cannabis industry, it's it's doubling every time I hear it. So now the last number I've heard was it's going to be probably reaching 30, 40 billion by 2024, 25. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, what we have to also be careful of is that we're now looking not only at medical cannabis, we're also looking at recreational. And that's sometimes where the numbers get mixed up. Yeah. Uh, as a recreational side, you look at Colorado, Washington, and, and a number of other states now, and Canada is going to follow. And also, you know, it, it contributes to a, to a massive um, new branch of, of industry coming in. I just recently heard that uh, the sales of legal cannabis are now outpacing those of tequila and even Girl Scout cookies. I was thinking about this before, the drinks industry, because obviously there's less of a hangover, excuse the pun, from, from cannabis, and especially the purer it is, like any drug, uh, recreational or not, the purer it is, the less harmful effects it may have afterwards. That's correct, yeah. And with the legalization, of course, um, you, you pretty much take out the, the shenanigans that have been done on the illegal market. Uh, I think people remember, I think it happened in Ireland where cannabis was laced with glass crystals. And uh, in Germany, we had a case where it was laced with lead just to make it heavier to, to increase the, the value you'd get for it. And those are things that the black market will do. Now that is completely taken out. So now you have fully controlled and, and you know, safety proven products out there. It's a huge pattern shift. And, and I suppose it's both these kind of forces, both cannabinoids as medicinal cannabis and then the recreational side, those both moving at the same force means that there's people getting into this that had never understood it as well. Like, but you have had, you've, you've training in this PhD and etc. And you're really set to understand it much deeper than others. I think that, I mean, as many people like myself, uh, even here in, in Ireland, um, I had talked to very um, very well-published uh, professors at, for example, NUI Galway, who have been working with cannabinoids for a long time. And 
we all have the same outlook at it, saying we want to look at the science and want to look, want to understand what's going on here. Um, this is a field for a scientist. It's massively interesting because the endocannabinoid system in the body, where the cannabinoids are working on, is connected to pretty much anything in the body. So it's very, very hard to find out what is actually going on. I can imagine there's going to be a flood of PhDs uh, getting their degrees working on cannabinoids in the next five, 10 years. And it's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, we just yesterday, um, GW Pharma, a big uh, cannabis uh, medical company, brought out the um, results from their clinical trial on Epidiolex. And it has shown that it really works on uh, children with severe epilepsy, so the uh, Dravet syndrome. Um, the case here with uh, Vera Toomey, or his daughter, uh, Ava, I think it's been a high profile case here in Ireland. Um, those are the, the patients that will benefit from trials like this. You, you talk to somebody 10 years ago about cannabis and they just go like, oh, he's a, you know, a drug addict. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people realize this is not the case. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's actually, uh, probably less harmful than alcohol would be, or definitely less harmful than cigarettes are, uh, which are two quote unquote legal drugs we have on the market pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And um, so that people are understanding this now, and that drives the change. And with that in connection with the medicinal abilities, uh, I think is is going to open up the worldwide change in the next five or ten years. So. South America is pretty much opening up now. Europe is opening up uh, and, and dropping the restrictions on it bit by bit, but it's coming fast. Yeah, and yeah. And, and Neil, so so obviously there was um, a, a black trade for a long time of of cannabis and other yeah. types of drugs, but by opening it up, what like wh where is all that growth literally happening? Where is the where is the cannabis being grown in the world? Is it everywhere? I can speak for Canada specifically. We have now about 40 what we call licensed producers. These are large um, businesses that either had a background already. I know one that had a background in growing uh, spinach and baby cucumbers. And they just said, well, we have greenhouses. We just, we're going to convert them and, and grow cannabis. And, you know, you're talking acres of greenhouses uh, that, that are being grown like a sea of green. Uh, producing kilos a month, like multiple. Yeah. They, I think last year, Canada had sold 10 tonnes of medical cannabis. So, Neil, just to get a little bit technical, but if you'd yeah. keep your simple explanation hat on, how does cannabinoid differ from psychoactive cannabis, so recreational versus medicinal? What's the difference there? Recreational versus medicinal, they're... they're aren't actually that many differences in the plant itself. We have THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the psychoactive quote unquote drug that most people associate when they think of the high that is produced by cannabis. But there are over 60 or 70 cannabinoids present or can be found in the plant. And not all of them will have an effect that intoxicate. Some of them do. But Cannabidiol, the one in the case of the epilepsy study, doesn't actually produce any high. You can ingest this and you won't, you won't notice anything. So there's no risk of substance abuse. Um, I always say it's less, you notice less than when you eat a spoonful of sugar. You, know? yeah. you get that sugar buzz and you don't even get that of, of uh, cannabidiol or CBD. And then there is CBN, which has been looked at, looking at uh, insomnia treatment. There's CBG, the cannabigerol. It, it, it just it goes on and on. Um, and only very few of them actually have a psychoactive effect. Right. So if somebody smokes a joint mm. anyway, right? So somebody smokes a normal uh, cannabis, a recreational, there's, yeah. the, there's the high and then there's the chill out. But the, the chill yeah. out actually probably is not the high. And they're, they're actually different elements. And, and this is why you hear of different strains, perhaps, of different weeds or different cannabis that, yes. that have different things. So it's they've higher elements of CBG versus CBD. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, and I don't think that we can only talk, and this is, I, I always find this very important to mention, cannabinoids are only one group of bioactive compounds in the plant. There's also uh, terpenes, um, limonene and myrcene. And we know those from um, citrus fruits, for example, uh, have a high amount of limonene. 
gives that citrusy smell you sometimes get. Um, and myrcene has a bit more of a skunky kind of smell. Those are also associated with anti-anxiety effects, uh, anti-depression effects, and even other physiological effects. So it's not only the cannabinoids, which is why, however we think it's, you know, cannabinoids by themselves, okay, that, that there is a there is a, an activity here, but it has been shown in publications as well that the full plant extract, so all of the components of the plant combined have a much better effect than just a single component. So the sum of, of the of the components is is larger than just all the single ones, you know, by themselves. Gotcha. And so so but what you what you would do with a kind of annoyed is versus ver, recreational versus medicinal is remove the psychoactive element. Yes. So we, we can in a medicinal one, there are medicinal strains that are very high in THC. So they will produce a high effect. Uh, that, for example, has been shown or is, is looking like it. I know a lot of um, patients suffering from PTSD, and uh, they seem to find the best effect with a high amount of THC. Uh, while people with epilepsy will probably, you know, THC could maybe even cause some epilepsy. So you don't want to have that in that medicinal extract or plant that you're using there. So it's very it's very difficult for doctors right now to figure out, well, my patient has anxiety. You know, medical cannabis, yes, but which one? So that's something we're, we're trying to mitigate as well, trying to actually bring out a, a medication where we say, this is good for anxiety. This is good for epilepsy. That is still a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, so you have to go through clinical trials, et cetera, of all that work. Absolutely. We have a bit of an advantage to the uh, this traditional pharmaceutical industry in that we don't have to develop or come up with the molecules they're already there nature has given them to us and we also have a safety that's proven over the over the years with the cannabinoids so we don't have to do a safety or not not such an extensive uh, safety test which we can bring us straight to more the efficacy trials to see how good does it really work what does canwevo do that's unique because you have a, a different extraction process what we do is um we we found that we need to look at it as a pharmaceutical application. And I don't want to put the negative connotation of pharmaceutical on there, but anything that is a, a, a medical drug is a pharmaceutical, really. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to see that we can apply the same technologies that we're doing for things like chemotherapy and uh, even vitamins at this point. You get the slow-release vitamin pills that makes them more effective. Um, and that's what we're doing with cannabinoids. We're developing the drug delivery, it's called um, the drug delivery technology, so that we can encapsulate cannabinoids or cannabis extracts and make them more efficient in the body, make them last longer or get released faster or get a targeted release. So all these, these things we can do with our technology. So we can look at a specific compound of the plant, put it into a small package, um, and that package has specific properties. So if we wanted to release its active load in the intestinal tract and not in the stomach, we can do that. So we can target and make the drugs much better. Niels, I, I heard Focus. I mean, we, we, I introduced you to Gene Fine, uh, founder of TerraJoy, who was on the show before. And Gene was telling me that it helps for Focus, so certain cannabinoids and, and, and certain, I'm sure it's certain extracts, etc. But they can actually help with focus for people. And this is a huge trend you see in the States. A lot, lot of startups, et cetera, in Silicon Valley are using focus pharmaceuticals. They're using different extracts, et cetera, to help with their own focus. I know people that um, you know like to use cannabis to study for exams. I also know people that say, I can't do that at all. <laughs> yeah. So I think it can help. But I also think we would have to look at what is it that really helps. And I, I think it might be something when we think of ADD, for example, you know, that is a condition that maybe get quieted out by the use of cannabis. Right. Quietens, quietens down the, the, the overload. Noise. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, the noise, exactly. So that can, it can help with focus, I suppose. So, so another, another scientific one for you. So in in a way, right? So you know the way some people will behave differently with different, um, like they may smoke the same yep. uh, strain, but 
they behave differently. What is that? Is that their their own genetic makeup? I have had conversations with people in drug development and, and medicine. And I remember one conversation with a gentleman from the United States who said, I believe that we have to tailor medicine to specific body types. We have to, you know, what works for one person doesn't work for the other person because there, there are different chemical reactions happening in their body types. He was talking about seven or eight different body types he considers. Um, you know, it's the same with alcohol. You see some people get aggressive on alcohol and some people get very emotional and some people get very loving. It's, it's an interesting one because I was thinking when you said about isolating cannabis, it's better as a sum of the parts. And if you yeah. kind of overlay that as a kind of a layer over a human, it's they are some of their parts as well, I suppose. It's, it's their mind, it's their reaction to things, it's their thoughts, it's what they have. Yeah the layers of thoughts and et cetera, and, and what they're made up of as, as well as gene- genetic makeup, that perhaps yeah. it's that mix of those two things. It, it could absolutely be. I mean, I know people that, that use cannabis to help them sleep. And I know people that say, when I consume cannabis, I can't sleep for the next two hours at least. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's the same compounds getting into the body, but probably react, reacting differently. And, uh, you know, you can, everybody is different. You know, people have, some people have higher blood pressure. Some people have lower blood pressure, just as an example, you know, it, and it would stand to reason to say that somebody with a low blood pressure reacts different to one medication than somebody with a high blood pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I suppose it's important to say to your, to our audience that you, you, you've, you've learned your trade, I suppose, through college. Yes. In Ireland, but you went to Canada but now you're back in Cork in the Rebel Bio Lab. Fantastic accelerator. It's uh, kind of slowly moving up to light speed here. I think um, it, it's a very it's a very uh, busy time. Of course, uh, we're, we're trying to get as much out of these. It's four months in total, so as much out of the four months uh, that we can to accelerate our business and uh, great mentorship. I think uh, you know Bill Yao, the director of, of Rebel Bio here. Yes. And, you know, we're tapping into a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of uh, previous companies that previously went through the, the accelerator coming in, talking about their experiences. Uh, and that, that helps immensely than, you know, when you're just starting a company and you're on your own. You've got to learn all, you know, from your own mistakes. It's, it helps a lot to hear what other people have done, what worked, what didn't work for them. Um, you know, professionals that are in marketing space, that are in the pharmaceutical space, that are... All, all those uh, mentors yeah. are make, make an amazing difference to starting a company. Brilliant. And, and then from, from the perspective of uh, investment, is there an opportunity for people to invest or how does that work with re- regards to the accelerator? Rebel Bio is uh, run by Sean O'Sullivan Ventures and we got an initial um, startup investment. And what we have to do now is we're trying to make that investment go, of course, the most efficient and longest way, but uh, we're all all the um, companies in the accelerator, including our own. We're looking for further investment, seed investment. So um, that is mostly in the realm between three hundred to about nine hundred thousand dollars. We're looking for, and uh, depending on on what the companies have to do, and a lot of the companies will. It's very typical for companies to do a second investment round a little bit later. Right. And, Okay, and, and how can people get in touch with you then for, for that? Because a lot of our audience is, uh, our main audience is US based and then Europe and then Ireland. So maybe there's some people out there that would like to get in touch with you. Well, they can uh, email us. Uh, our emails are on our website, www.canoevo.net. Um, or email me directly at niels at canoevo.net. And uh, I'll be glad to answer any and all questions. Yeah, and so the final question then, when when will we see uh, Canwevo on the shelves, do you think? We hope to get on the natural health product market first, and it is probably going to happen between August and October this year. You know, pharmaceutical development takes a long time, and even with the slightly, as I explained earlier, shortened path to a pharmaceutical, we're still looking at seven, maybe 10 years to, to get a pharmaceutical on the market. But uh, the natural health product market is you know, much lower barrier. And uh, we can start marketing uh, some of our products straight there. Brilliant. Well, Niels Raymond, CEO and founder of Canwevo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.